So today, what I want to talk about are inverse functions. This is from section 5.3. And finding inverse functions is not necessarily new to you. It's something we do in pre-calculus, for example. And I want to be able to go through and find inverse functions. I want to detect whether a, an original function even has an inverse function and some of the properties involved. And then ultimately, the most important thing will be at the end where we actually take the derivative of the inverse function. Now, the strange thing that's going to happen at the end is we're going to be able to depict the inverse function on a graph, and we might not be able to actually express it as an algebraic function. We, we might not be able to say f, f minus 1 of x is this expression. Now, if you can do that, if you actually find the inverse function and say, here it is, f minus 1 of x is right here, then naturally you can just take its derivative. But if you don't even have a function to begin with, how do you take its derivative? We'll get into that at the end here. So I want to get started by defining what an inverse function actually is. So a regular function, f of x, the way that works is your input, they're numbers from your domain. And your domain are basically a big collection of x values. And it's really, it's a mapping. It, it transports you to a new value, the new value being y. We call this the output. And we also call this the range. So what this looks like, your domain is sort of this big bubble of numbers. Now some functions, they don't have a domain that consists of every real number. Like you might not find every real number in here. There's some functions that only have positive numbers in here. Like a square root function, for example, should only have positive numbers inside. Let's use that as a good example. So in this particular domain, for this particular function, you will find no negative numbers because if you apply the function to your domain numbers, you should get some kind of answer. And if you apply square root of x to a negative number, you don't get an answer. We need these to be transported over into this new bubble called the range. And the trans the transport, the transformation is really going to be your function is what's going to do that. And our function is, of course, square root of x. So domain and range. These are x's. These are y's. So what happens when you take 4 and put it into your square root function? You land over here at the number 2. What happens when you take 7 and you put it into your function? You land over here at this number, square root of 7. 3 quarters you land at square root of 3 over 2. So each of these x values has a corresponding y value over here. What happens is we want an inverse function. So what we do is we, we collect our numbers from our range, and we bring them down here to a new bubble that we'll once again call a domain again. So we have numbers like 2. Numbers like square root of 7. Numbers like square root of 3 halves. And I'm trying to find the new function that beams them into the new range, transports them in. And the new range is the old domain, actually. So we're supposed to get numbers like 4 back. We're supposed to get numbers like 7 back. And we're supposed to get numbers like 3 quarters back. Okay. So what is that inverse function? So the first thing I think you notice that with an inverse function, the domain and range get swapped. X's and Y's get swapped. And you're going to see that a lot today in this video, that X's and Y's actually roles get reversed. And the same with domain and range, because those are X's and Y's. Now, I think you could certainly infer what this inverse function must be. It's the opposite of square root of X. It's got to be X squared. It's got to be X squared. Now, what is the definition of an inverse function? The definition of an inverse function, if you had a function f of x, 
and you had as companion the inverse function over here. We give it a name, f minus 1. So this is the original function. And this is the inverse function. I want you to think of the inverse function as like the undo key on your computer, basically. It undoes whatever the original function does. So let's say that, um, let's say that we start at a particular x location. It can be any x location you would like. And I'll call that our home base, basically. This is where we start the problem. Now, you bring in f of x, you bring in your function, you surround it around your, encompass it around your variable there, and now you're at a new location. f of x is now the current y value. But how do you undo that? You undo that by taking the current y value and putting it inside the inverse function, like this. Now, x is where we started, f of x is the new location, the y value, and the inverse on that y value ought to take me home. In a sense, f minus 1 and f basically cancel each other out. And you can do this in either order, by the way. You can have the f on the outside and composite your functions together that way, and you should still be brought home. This is proof positive that you have the correct inverse function. You would actually prove it by, um, by checking this composite function. So let's do this. I'm going to verify inverse functions. So let's say uh, f of x is. Um, x cubed plus 2. Well, I have a proposal for you. The proposal is that f minus 1 would be the opposite of all that. Well, so instead of x cubed, I would say cube root. That's the opposite. Instead of plus 2, I would say minus 2. But I guess one of the issues here might be, well, which order do I do that in? So there are actually two ideas on the table. One is that you do the cube root of x, and then you do minus 2. And the other idea on the table might be that I do the cube root of x minus 2. In other words, I subtract 2 first, and then I take the cube root. Now, those are definitely different which one's correct. So let's verify that one of these is the inverse. Maybe we'll test this one right here. So how do you verify that? Well, the definition says that if you were to composite the two together, you're supposed to get the letter x back. Let's try it. Now, how do you do composite functions? Well, the best way to do composite functions is focus your attention on the outer function. In this case, I've decided f minus 1 to be the outer function. We look over here, and what does f minus 1 like to do to input? Well, I've done it in this order, where I take 2 away and then do cube root. This entire thing in here is my input. So let's start with that. Let's take 2 away, and let's do a cube root. That's how I get started when I verify these. I run the outer function on this as my input, f of x. Now I look at f of x and say, but I know what f of x is. It's right there. So this is the cube root of f of x is x cubed plus 2. And then, of course, there's your minus 2. And it does look pretty good, doesn't it? So this must be my inverse function. I've verified it to be true. So yes, it's a nice thing to be able to verify if a function truly isn't the inverse. And the best way to do that is you do your composite f minus 1 of f of x or f of f minus 1. And you should get x. If you don't get x, if you get anything other than x, then you really don't have the correct inverse function. So that's the way we verify. Um, how about graphing an inverse function? Let's take a look at what an inverse function actually looks like. If you were to have a curve, maybe a curve like, I don't know, uh, like this, f of x, it turns out that if that function truly has an inverse version of itself, the undo key, 
I'll show you where it'll show up on the graph. It's not here. This is the line y equals x. And it actually came through and touched it. I wasn't expecting that, but that's okay. We can work with that. Do you remember I talked about the reversal of the roles of x and y? That's what happens. You get a reversal on the roles of x and y. In fact, for this particular point, I maybe don't know the x value, but I certainly know the y value is 0. So the companion point will be found over here where x is equal to 0. Because y was equal to 0 here, so this point x should be equal to 0. And then whatever x value you have for here, you end up getting a y value up there. So you get a reversal. You get a reflection across the line y equals x. Let's do a few more of these reflections. Uh, here's a point right here that will reflect right across and end up over there. This point kind of reflects locally right about there. This point reflects across and shows up over here. Let's do a bunch more reflections here and find out where we're going to be. Um, what you want to do is basically you want to hit this line perpendicularly, and you go the same distance across. What you're going to get is this beautiful reflection of this curve. Let's sketch it in here. So I'll highlight my inverse function so we can tell the difference. I'm just trying to make the shape correct here, because then it shoots off, right? It goes off like that. So that's called the reflective property, that if a function has an inverse, it shows up on your graph as a reflection across the line y equals x, and it's all because of the reversal of variables, the reversal of x and y. So if this point here was, let's say, 5 comma 0, the reflection would be 0 comma 5, and then that's why that coordinate would be on there. Apparently, any points that actually touch y equals x will actually remain on the inverse function. You get the same point because it's, it's really on that mirror. So that's called the reflective property, and we will definitely use that uh, when we're working with derivatives. So this should all be review. Nothing new about inverse functions necessarily, but I will discuss how you, number one, find an inverse function, and number two, how to detect if a function even has an inverse. There are curves that don't have an inverse function. So I want to talk about that as well. You know that if you draw a curve like this, there's a lovely test that's quickly able to tell us if it's a function or not, and that's the vertical line test. This passes the VLT vertical line test with flying colors. Therefore, this is indeed a function. Curves that roll back on themselves, they kind of curl back on themselves. It kind of would, they'd have to kind of curl back on themselves like that. They fail the vertical line test. And the reason is because for this particular value of x, there's actually three valid y values. And functions certainly don't work that way. We know that by now. Um, functions only are supposed to be providing one y value. So for any given x, one y value. They're supposed to be very reliable in that way. That curve, that one x value is producing three different, it can't make up its mind. It's this x, this y value, the middle one or the top one, which one is it? Functions can only provide you with one y value to be valid as a function. So that's for just detecting functions. We have the vertical line test. I want to use the reflective property on a parabola because I'd like to find the inverse for y equals x squared, the undo key. Now, you're probably thinking, I know the answer to that. The opposite of x squared is square root of x. It turns out that is not the inverse for y equals x squared, strange as it may seem. Let's check it out. Here's our parabola. Here's the line y equals x cutting right through it. 
fact, it touches the point 1 comma 1 right there. And now let's do our reflection across the line y equals x. Because even if we can't figure out the algebraic version of the inverse function, we can at least graph it. So I'm going to bold it up, and I'm going to call this my inverse function. There it is, guys. So this point here got reflected across from here to here. These got reflected. These got reflected. These got reflected. That's what the inverse function is supposed to look like. It's a reflection across the curve y equals x. What's the problem? Let's take a look. This isn't even a function. It fails the vertical line test. Let me demonstrate. Failure. So how can we call that the inverse function when it's not even a function? It's not. So there must be curves or functions that don't really have inverses. And this is one of them right here. So how do we detect that without having to go through this process? Well, what we're really trying to do is the vertical line test on the reflection of this curve. But what if you reflected this vertical line back over to the original curve? You know what it becomes? It becomes a horizontal line. So therefore, the horizontal line test can determine whether the function has an inverse or not. So I still want you to use the vertical line test, of course, on a function. If you draw a curve, you do the vertical line test, check it off, it's a function. But then do the horizontal line test, and that will tell you whether or not this curve really possesses an inverse. There's another test that we can perform. And that is, um, we can determine if is the function, the original function, one to one. Now they talk about this in the book, and what do they mean by one to one? For any one particular y value, there should only be one x value that produces it. So the one-to-one -one property allows us to determine if it's a function or, um, or if, you, if it has an inverse function or not. So for any one particular y value, there should only be one x that produces it. Well, come on up to our original curve, which is x squared. And here's a particular y value, y equals 4, let's say. And there are two x values that produce it, this x value and this x value. That would be 2 and minus 2. So you could say, all right, therefore, it does, does not pass the one-to-one -one test, and, and therefore, it does not have an inverse function. So some curves have inverse functions, some do not. So I do want you to be able to determine whether a function has an inverse. The quickest way to do that is the horizontal line test. OK. And now, finally, let's get to the ability uh, to actually find an inverse function. Let's find an inverse function. So let's say I gave you f of x is equal to 3x cubed plus 4 over 2. The first thing is you should have an inkling as to what the inverse should have in it. Um, what should this inverse function have? It should have things like cube root. That's the opposite of x cubed. It should have things like minus 4. That's the opposite of plus 4. It should have things like 
times 2, that's the opposite of divide by 2, it should have an operation like divide by 3 because that's the oppos opposite of times 3. So we actually have a very good idea of what this inverse ought to look like. The problem is this. Four operations, what order do I do them in? So I'm going to give you a procedure that gets you that inverse function and gets it to you correctly each time. And just follow the steps, and we'll get there. So the first step is number one. Let's replace f of x with y, because that's what it used to be called. Number two, reverse, or let's not say reverse, let's say swap the roles of x and y, because that's really the nature of an inverse. X's become Y's and Y's become X's. So wherever you see an X, let's use a Y instead. Wherever you see a Y, let's use an X instead. Number three, I want you to solve for Y. And number four, give your new function its name. F minus one. Name your function. By naming it, I mean replace the y with that. OK. Four-step procedure. I think we should be able to do this. Let's go ahead and start with this function. Let's replace f of x with y. So let's write that y equals 3x cubed plus 4 over 2. Next step, reverse the roles of x and y. So instead of a y, I'm going to put an x. Instead of an x, I'm going to put a y. Solve for y. Go ahead and solve for y by kind of peeling away some of the layers here. So 2x is 3y plus 4. Of course, the next step should be minus 4, minus 4. So now let's see where we're at. Um, 3y cubed is 2x minus 4, divide by 3, next step, divide by 3. And finally, y cubed is 2x minus 4 over 3, but we want y, so cube root of both sides, please. Cube root of both sides. And it looks like we got our inverse function, but let's give it a name. Now, how can we be sure that that's the inverse function? Well, first of all, it ought to have all of the four operations that I talked about. Um, I didn't know what order to put them in, but they should all be there. And let's double check that. The four operations that I was suspecting that we would find in our inverse function are right over here. A cube root, a minus 4, a times 2, a divide by 3. There's your cube root. There's your minus 4. There's your times 2. And there's your divide by 3. So certainly leads me to believe that we have the correct inverse function. The second thing I need you to do is verify it. Let's check it. It's going to be a little bit of work, but I have to do a composite function. Let's do f minus 1 of f of x or the other order. It doesn't matter which order you do it in, but let's do this. And the question mark is, do we really get x? And if we get x, we know we have the right inverse function. All right. The original function, I'll put that right here for reference, was 3x cubed plus 4 over 2. And this is completely the opposite, apparently. Now, you know how I like doing composite functions. I actually uh, like to work with the outer function so much that I actually cover that one up. I want to forget it for the moment. This is my outer. This is my inner. Actually, this is my inner argument. So f minus 1 is a function, accepts input. And all you got to do is replace whatever you put in these parentheses in here for x. So f minus 1 does its work. Cube root of 2 times, well, whatever I put inside, not x, f of x. That's the way to get started. And now, of course, you can reveal that's what f of x truly is. So let's put it in there. This is the cube root of 2 times f of x, 3x cubed plus 4 over 2. 
minus 4 all over 3. Now, now let's see if this really reduces to the letter x. This 2 cancels with that 2. So now I have the cube root of x, 3x cubed plus 4 minus 4 over 3. Of course, these cancel out pretty nicely. And now I have the cube root of 3x cubed over 3. These cancel out pretty nicely. And there it is, guys. We've got our x. And that's certainly proof positive that we have our inverse function. OK. Let's start doing some calculus on this. So that's just the baseline of how you find an inverse, how you check it, how you verify it. Now I want to do calculus. And the calculus that I'd like to do on, on an inverse function is the derivative. I'd like to take the derivative of the inverse function. And I'd like to determine the slope of the tangent line to the inverse function. The inverse function is just a function like any other. So I should be able to get the slope of the tangent line at a specific point if I need to. So I've got a question about this particular problem. f minus 1 is this. What I would like to do is, I'm just trying to find a good number here. Let's do this. Let's find f minus 1 prime at x equals 8. This is the terminology we use, by the way. f minus 1 is the function, prime is the derivative, and basically what that says is what is the slope of the tangent line at x equals 8. Now, the problem here is um, it's not that it's called f minus 1. That's just, it's just a name. I mean, this is just a function. The problem is taking the derivative might be a little laborious because it's a cube root. But let's do it. OK, the original function is a cube root. Yes, that does make life just a little tougher. And so this is a 1 third power. And there's nothing fancy about it. It's like, you got a function, get your derivative, plug your 8 in, get your answer. It's just that it's called f minus 1. That's the only difference here. So what is f minus 1 prime? That's a derivative, just like any other. The 1 third drops down. Deduct 1 from your exponent. No change to that argument, please. times chain rule. So you can check this off, but look what's multiplied up against your x here. It's not just 2. It's actually 2 thirds. So what's the derivative of 2x over 3? Because you've got to do the derivative of the inner function. Well, the derivative of the inner function is 2 thirds. So your derivative is the following. It's 2 over 9. And if you want to do this, you certainly can. A negative exponent means everything's upside down. So why don't we just make it easier on ourselves and turn it right side up? I think that would be cleaner, don't you? I don't think we've ever done that before. But that's certainly an option here. How bad was that? It wasn't that bad. OK, it was a chain rule, big, t big chain rule to remember to do the derivative of the inner function. That's something that's really important, and it really does get overlooked too much. Derivative of the outer times the derivative of the inner. All right, now that we have our derivative, is this going to be that hard? I don't know if it's going to be a pretty answer, but uh, we can put our 8 in there and get our answer that way. Let's get that answer. Two times eight is sixteen. Sixteen minus four is twelve. 
Unfortunately, it's to the two-thirds power. I know that is not really the best deal over there, that exponent. However, this is just a quarter to the two-thirds power. So what's the answer? Well, you can either do the cube root now or you can do the squared now. It's up to you. I think we'll do, let's do the squared first. So I did the squared. I don't need that two anymore. So here's the answer. And, you know, I'm just going to leave it as is for now. I wish it was a square root of 16. That's a problem I could have simply done in the chain rule chapter. There's nothing new about that. It's just that it, it was a lot of work, wasn't it? But that is the answer. That is f minus 1 prime at x equals 8. Now, x equals 8 being on that original curve. Now, I want to show you a better way to do it. We know there's something special about this function. We know there's something special because it is the inverse function. So I actually know where to graph this function. I also know that there's this reflection across the line y equals x. So it's hard to graph this particular function. And I'm going to set this aside because I, I want to I see that number. And I want to see it in a different uh, problem here, a different way to get that number. But uh, I, all I can say is this. If the original function were right here, the original function were right here, and I drew the line y equals x right across, we know that this is f of x here. f minus 1 is going to show up as a reflection. It's going to show up as a reflection across here. So basically, we reflect perpendicular and equidistant. We reflect here perpendicular and equidistant. And so the curve is going to look something like this. So this curve up here is f minus 1. Now, let's say that you want f minus 1 at x equals 8. And let's say x equals 8 is maybe right here. Now, I'm not saying I really know what the y value is quite yet, but I do know that I want my derivative at x equals 8. Well, that derivative is right about here. It's a slope, and you can see it right here. And that is the prize that I'm looking for, m at x equals 8. It's no different than any other function, the slope of the line at a particular point. Look across at your original function, because there's something going on over here. There's a companion point right here. Now, I'm going to label this point as 8, comma, I'm not sure. Let's call it B, because I'm just i not sure what that is yet. Would you agree that this point is B, comma, 8? So remember, there's this reflection across the line y equals x. Remember, there's a reversal of x's and y's. So the companion point should have the original coordinate reversed, which it does. What if I were to draw the tangent slope here? Let's call this one m2. And let's call this one m1, m2 and m1. Are they the same? 
zoom in and take a look. They're not the same. The most I could say about them is that they're both positive, but they're not the same. Here's something that's really interesting that you can take advantage of. Because of the reversal of variables, you're reversing x's and y's. You're also reversing rise and run. Because the old run, which was x's, becomes the new rise. The old rise, which was y's, becomes the new run, because now they're x's. So rise over run gets flipped and becomes run over rise. So there is a relationship between these two slopes. The rise and run get flipped. And how do you flip things? Well, reciprocal is what flips things. So if you really, really want to know this slope here, it ends up that it's simply the reciprocal of this slope right here. Now, why that is valuable is because it's on the original curve. So where's the value in that? The value in that is you don't even need to find the inverse function. That's the value. Look how much work it took me to get the inverse function. Look how much work it took me to then take the derivative of the inverse function. I mean, it was a lot of work. And then I put the 8 in. Well, this method says not only do you not have to find the inverse function, you certainly don't have to even take the derivative of the inverse function. So there's some definite power in that. So what are we going to do then? What is M1? What is this? M1 is just F prime. But I want you to see the most important thing that I'm trying to stress and emphasize here. It is not F prime at 8. I'll repeat that. It is not F prime at 8. You want F prime at 8, guys? Where are you? You're like over here somewhere. That has nothing to do with this area up here. You need the F prime of B. And what is B? That's actually the y coordinate off or from the inverse function. So that is an important thing to note because people forget that all the time. They do f prime 8. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to find the slope of the tangent line to my inverse curve at x equals 8 on the inverse curve. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to do f prime of the original function. I'm going to do 1 over that reciprocal, 1 over. And the tricky part is you don't put 8 into f prime. You have to put the y value from the inverse function in there. So let's see if we can maybe pull this off on the last problem and get the same answer. So the prize is this, f minus 1 prime at 8. And what that's going to be is 1 over f prime at b. I got some work to do to find out what that b is. It is the old y value from the inverse. So that is one thing we're going to have to work on. Um, but f prime is not going to be so bad. I don't think it will. So we got two jobs to do here. Number one, can we get the y value for 8 on our inverse function? Let's see if we can get that. It's just a y value, but it's from the inverse, of course. So I need my inverse function to do that. So here's my inverse function. Um, f minus 1 is the cube root of 2x minus 4 over 3. OK. So what's f minus 1 of 8? This is not calculus. This is finding out the y value of where we are. 2 times 8 minus 4 over 3. That's going to be the cube root of 16 minus 4 
That's 12 over 3. It's the cube root of 4. So that was not so bad. And that's that B that I'm looking for. That's the Y value. So the coordinate is 8 comma cube root of 4. And this is on the inverse function. OK. So we got the y value. It wasn't so painful. And honestly, sometimes I'll even tell you the y value. Sometimes I'll even give you both x and y. Now, the point I'm giving you is on the inverse curve. We're going to actually leverage this new property that we learned. And I'm not even going to use the inverse curve anymore. I'm going to use the original curve. Because I want you to take a look one more time at this reflective property. We're up here on an inverse function right now that has a coordinate 8 comma cube root of 4. But we're going to come across to this point, which is cube root of 4 comma 8. I would like to know the slope of the original curve at x equals cube root of 4. So again, we don't use the 8 in our derivative. And then, of course, I got to do the reciprocal of that derivative because that is the true relationship between these two slopes. So I think we can do this as follows. Here we are looking for the slope of the inverse curve at 8. And the way we're going to do it, 1 over f prime at not 8. Be careful, guys. Use the old y value from the inverse. It's not a pretty one, but there it is. So on an exam, for example, I will say to you, I have a function f of x. But I want the slope of the tangent line to the inverse function. And I want the slope on the inverse function at this point. I don't know, 1 comma 2. And you're going to say, well, I don't even really need to worry about that inverse function. I'm going to do 1 over f prime, the original function, but not at 1. You do it at 2. And that's the one thing that a lot of people forget. You do it at the old y value, because the old y value becomes the new x value on your function, your original function. So there it is, the old y value off the inverse function. Well, I know what i got to do. I've got to find the original function again, and I've got to take its derivative. So let's find that original function. Here it is. It's going to be a whole lot easier, I think, to do it this way. So this is 3 halves x cubed plus 2. f prime would be 3 halves. The 3 comes down. Deduct 1 from the exponent, please. And then derivative 2 is 0. So look what I got. It was so much easier than working with all those cube roots. Wow, that's so much easier. f prime equals 9 halves times x squared. So much easier to do it that way. So here it is again. If you want the derivative, you want the slope on an inverse function, go to the original function, get its derivative, and then we do 1 over that. And the only other thing to remember is you don't put x in there. You actually put the y value from the inverse. Okay. So uh, right now, we need 1 over that. But wait. Let's do our f prime of our cube root of 4. And let's find out what that slope was on the original curve. Nine halves. Cube root of 4 squared, that squared can reach inside. Let's do cube root of 16. OK. So that's like my, my m1, OK? So what we just did was we have an original curve. Here's my original curve. I went right here, right here. to. This is my b, actually. I did not go to 8. I went to cube root of 4, which is the old y value. And I simply did my derivative to get m1. I got it. Well, the beauty here is m2, the real answer you want off the inverse, is simply the reciprocal of that. Let's see if we can do that. So therefore, the prize that I've been seeking, which is the, the derivative or slope of the tangent line, 
at x equals 8 on the inverse, the 8 is on the inverse, is equal to the 1 over this thing. Now, you know the 2 is going to flip up. I think we got it right. Because when I did it the hard way, that's the same answer I got using the hard approach. Now, you're probably saying, can I just do it the other way? I mean, I'll go through the effort. I'll find the inverse function. And you know what? Once I have a, a function in hand, it's no different than any other problem. I'll just go ahead and get f prime. I'll go ahead and I'll stick the 8 in there because you're on the inverse curve, and then you'll get the answer. That's what I did originally. So you're probably thinking, I have no need for this new method. I'll just do it the other way. It's harder, but I'll do it the other way. Well, what happens when you run into a problem like this one? f of x is x cubed plus x plus 1. Now, if you were to graph this function, you would see that it passes the horizontal line test. It does possess that one-to-one -one property. So for any given y value, there's only one magic x that makes it. That's not true for a parabola. Remember, for a parabola, y equals 4. There's actually two different x's that can make that, 2 and minus 2. So parabola really doesn't have an inverse function necessarily. This one does, so let's find it. Reverse the roles of x and y. Solve for y. Uh-oh. How do you solve for y? Now, in order to solve for y, you're only supposed to have y equals on this side and only x's and numbers on that side. And we certainly don't want y cubed. So I don't know. Maybe try this. I mean, that's a valid approach. Divide by y squared plus 1. Is that an idea? No. The reason is you're not supposed to have y's over there. We're really supposed to end up with y equals a function of x. So the strange thing about this curve is it does have an inverse. But I can't seem to express it. That's pretty frustrating. Because we know it has an inverse. If you graph it, it does pass the horizontal line test, guarantees that it does have an inverse function. And then we went ahead and tried to find it, and I can't find it. Now, if you graph the function f of x, you draw the line y equals x, and you reflect it across, you can actually see the function very clearly. And you can even graph the function very clearly. But I cannot express it. So that is a problem. If you can't even express a function, you can certainly forget about taking a derivative. We don't even have a function to take the derivative of. So now there's only one way out, and that's to use the technique I just talked about. So for this problem, I can ask a question. So we'll go back here. And you know, be careful, because I am going to give you functions that do have inverses that you cannot find. And yet I'm going to ask a question like this. Find the slope of the tangent line to the curve f minus 1 that you could very well see with your eyes. If you graph this and reflect, you'll find it and you'll see it at an I'll be kind. I'll give you a full coordinate here. 3, comma 1, which is the x and y. And remember that this is on the inverse curve. 
Now, if that's on the inverse curve, how about a reminder that the point 1, comma 3 is on the original curve? It's a nice reminder because you get a reversal of x and y. So find the slope of the tangent line to a curve you can't even express, but you can visualize at this particular coordinate. That coordinate is on this curve. Now, let me make sure I got that coordinate correctly, because as I promised you, if this coordinate's on the inverse, reverse x and y, this has to be on the original. Now, this really is an x and a y on the original. So when x equals 1 plus 1 plus 1, y does equal 3. So it is a valid point. 1 comma 3 is a valid point on the original. Therefore, 3 comma 1 is a valid point on the inverse. So here is where it actually gets to be not so difficult anymore to do this because I'm going to ask for f minus 1 prime at x equals 3 because normally we plug x into our derivative to get our slope. And look how easy it actually is. The slope of the tangent line to the inverse curve is 1 over the slope of the tangent line on the original curve. But don't put a 3 in here, because look at where we are. The companion point on the original is 1, 3. So you've got to do it like I keep saying, at the old y value from the inverse curve. The old y value on the inverse becomes the new x value on the original. So let's do f prime. f prime equals 3x squared plus 1. f prime of 1 equals 3 plus 1 is 4. And so the ultimate payoff here is you're about to find the slope of a tangent line to a curve that you can't even really express. You can see it, but you can't express it algebraically, and yet we can do calculus on it. It's one quarter. So take note of what we did. Um, and that is definitely the calculus aspect of inverses that I want you to know about. And that is, if you want the slope of a tangent line on an inverse function, go to the original and do 1 over its derivative. But remember the reversal of variables. That's important. So if the inverse curve has 3, 1, on the original curve, the companion point will be 1, 3. So we're operating at x equals 1. So you've got to do f prime at 1. That's really the major sticking point to this method. Other than that, it's f prime and it's 1 over f prime. It's not that hard. And remember the reversal of x and y, and you'll be able to do it. So try some of those inverse problem, pro, uh, practice problems, homework. Um, know how to find an inverse. Know how to verify an inverse. Know how to determine if a function even has an inverse using the horizontal line test or the one-to-one -one property. And naturally, this is the most important part here. Know how to find the slope of a tangent line to an inverse function, even when you can't express the inverse function. It's amazing. We can still do it. Thanks a lot. Work on the homework. And I'll see you soon.